Le cheval plaît beaucoup. Hein. C'est un vecteur de communication extraordinaire. Avant d'être un cavalier, c'est important d'être un, un horseman. Always put the horse before the personal ambitions. Vraiment un cheval incroyable. Voilà quelqu'un qui est champion olympique et qui n'est pas ordinaire. Se remettre en question et de se servir des défaites pour être meilleur après. Ce feeling, je l'ai eu directement avec Kellogg. On fait du haut niveau, il y a le côté financier, c'est comme ça. Aller en compétition parce qu'il est bon, pas parce qu'il paye une table. Moi, je veux pas courir mes chevaux pour l'argent. If you can do it in a way that doesn't take too much out of your horses. Quand on voit l'évolution en, en 10 ans de temps, qu'est-ce que ça va être dans 10 ans Pouvoir motiver les jeunes à aller au bout de leurs rêves. Forme de très très bons compétiteurs. Je ne vais pas dire que ça forme des hommes de chevaux. Pour moi, les bons moments, ils sont à venir. Aujourd'hui, réussir sa vie, c'est avoir la vie que l'on souhaite. How does one become the best rider in the world? The Geneva Five Star CHI is definitely the place to meet world number one riders. Remember, two years ago, we had the great honor of meeting Peter Fredriksen. Back then, Peter was on the top of the ranking list. Last year, we met another Swedish rider and world number one, Henrik van Eckermann, and had the chance to spend an hour with him to record an inspiring, exciting and very rewarding episode. Henrik van Eckermann is one of those who leave nothing to chance. He is impressive of his talent, his performance, but also his vision. He is an accomplished, hardworking, fair, discreet, thoughtful and ambitious sportsman. He has had great success with a certain Marie Lou and became both Olympic and world champion with the unbeatable King Edward. Thanks to all these victories and successes, the rider settled at CEO stables, has climbed up to the top of the world ranking list and has been unchallenged since August 2022. It seems that nothing can stop him. Henrik's mantra is... If you don't take any risk in life, you will never learn. But if you do, if you challenge yourself and step out of your comfort zone, you have a good chance to succeed, to win. And that is what life is. A few words that say a lot about his episode. Here we go. I will leave you with the current world number one, Henrik van Eckermann. This episode is sponsored by Data Sport. We recorded an episode with Caroline Boudier, CEO of Data Sport, back in May 2019, at the very beginning of I'm an Equestrian. So here is a little catch-up with Caroline. Uh, Hi, Caro. Thank you very much for having us in your new Dada Sport offices in Paris. It's been four years since we recorded our first episode with you. It was one of the very first episodes of I Am an Equestrian. For all those who didn't listen to this episode, we invite you to discover the episode number three of I Am an Equestrian with Caroline Boudier, founder of Dada Sport. We are back together today as you are doing us the honor to support our episode with world number one, Henrik van Eckermann. Caro, it will be too hard to summarize, but could you tell us what has happened in those last four years at Dada Sport? So, four years ago, COVID hit us, and after that, we've been able to grow significantly. We have grown a lot from a business point of view, but also from a team point of view, meaning that we have tripled all staff, which is also a real challenge in itself, as we have to find profiles that match with our values, people with whom we're also going to work in the same direction for a while and to work for the same ambitions while really sharing the same beliefs. I'm really proud that I have been able to find profiles that are in line with my values and with the values that I would like to instill in data sport. As a result, we are all working on this and it's a real strength for the brand and I think you can feel it. Another point that seems crucial to me and a notion that's essential to many people at Data Sport, this is the notion of agility. The post-COVID years were indeed very energizing in a way that was very paradoxical for Data Sport. And now we're going through a period that is a little more complicated, as we all know. The crisis brings a lot of challenges and that's good. We never rest on our laurels. And that's what we call Agility, knowing how to adapt, how to question ourselves, how to keep improving and to go where we are not expected. 
also to comply with the needs of our customers that also keep evolving. I think that today what we are all looking for is slightly different from what we were looking for in 2019 or 2020. We give other meanings to our lives. I think that this notion of agility, we've always been agile, but it's even more true today. And finally, for the last four years, there is a topic that we've started to talk about. That's the true necessity to become conscious of our impact as a clothing brand, of our environmental and social impact, and therefore also to propose a more recent consumption. As a reminder, we create all clothes from A to Z. That is to say that we do all the conception, the design is made in-house, we source everything, we manage all our purchases. We want to control each and every part of the process. And we aim to have direct control on the sourcing process, to be able to propose clothes which are more respectful of the planet. We're not going to say that we are organic. We are very careful with greenwashing too, but we do work with materials in recycled threads. We make our best to limit our transport and to reduce our use of plastic. And of course, we launched our second-hand platform. This is a project that is aligned with your values as well. Yes, of course. And this is a project that I'm personally very proud of because it's very important to practice a more circular economy and to encourage the circularity in the clothing industry. We all have our closets overflowing with clothes and at some point we have to know how to pad them on. We make products that have a long lifespan. We are positioned as a high-end brand that uses materials that last over time. So it made sense to launch this platform and to say, let's consume better. We wanted to offer our customers a solution to actually do it. You say that you have tripled the number of employees in the company, and I believe that you have also had an exponential growth in terms of turnover. Do you feel that you have succeeded in keeping the identity of Dada, the universe of Dada, and therefore the basis of how you wished to frame the brand when you initially launched it? Yes, really. And that, I think, is really the result of our recruitment. And that's why I was saying that I'm very proud of it, because I'm surrounded by a team of women who are incredible and who are also involved and committed to the project, just like me. There is a real sharing of values that also makes everything I have imagined beforehand better and everything that is data sport. In fact, by relying on people, we go even further and eventually it has not changed at all. It's just a continuity. And I think that today, data conveys even more values than it did at the very beginning. So you girls launched the Dada Second End platform at the end of 2022. And then, if we are here today together, it's because there is also a big announcement to come. The release of Dada Line dedicated to men. And if I'm not mistaken, Closing for Men had existed at the very beginning and it's now coming back in 2023 with a wider range. Can you tell us about the desire to develop, redevelop this line today? If we really go back to the origin of Data Sports, the idea was to create a business on the long term. I really wanted to create something and to go step by step, to build solid foundations, to be able to deploy ourselves in a more perennial way once we had really done the work of building the foundations. By this, I mean sourcing finding the right partners, having some very accurate expertise in our industry. It's true that at the beginning it was quite legitimate in the end to really focus on women. There were real issues for female writers and needs that were urgent to be addressed. And we had actually launched a few products for men. At the very beginning we tested stuff and then we had to focus on segments because we couldn't do everything at the same time. So at the very beginning we really focused on challenging the clothing for women writers. 
so that we feel pretty in our clothes that needed to be comfortable and easy to maintain. And there were real stakes that we managed to address, I think. I think the difference at Dada is that we are a team of women who think and create products for women. This was a real asset for us. We were also very much solicited by men who chased us to develop male clothing as well. It was a real shift for us as we are a brand that's identified for women. But the values we advocate are not only for women, it also affects men and our know-how can be completely duplicated for men. It was the right time for us to open up to this new market. First of all, because it's an additional challenge and it's great to work on a new line. It took us a lot of time, a lot of work to really think about who the Dada man is and to surround ourselves with people and ambassadors who are aligned with that. And so the Dada man is notably Henrik van Eckermann, whom we spotted wearing a Dada sweater when we recorded his episode in Geneva. Why then, Henrik? You have picked a couple of men to endorse your identity and values. Can you tell us about that? Est-ce que tu peux nous parler de ça Alors, c'est, on a vraiment beaucoup de chance euh, d'être entouré We par are really lucky to be surrounded by such ambassadors, such champions. We have to admit that they followed us a bit blindly in this adventure. I think that's also thanks to the work we did on the women line before all these years that we also gained the confidence of some men and we hope not to disappoint them. And it's true that working with champions like Henrik or Mark, it encourages us to upgrade and further our work, and um, that's what we like. We're surrounded by people who are at the top of their sport, who will help us to be even more relevant. And I say relevant because we are essentially women at Dada, so even more relevant in our offer for men. These two writers, um, especially Henrik, he is a man, I think, who... It's all about precision, work, accuracy, someone who thinks deep. And I think that's really what we wanted to convey and what we are. So it's quite natural that we also went for profiles like Henrik or Mark. And our idea was also to work in duo with the women line. As we know, our wardrobe is quite versatile. We like to mix and combine writing and daily fashion. But there is also this attempt to provide clothes that fit men, but that can also dress the woman. This is quite a challenge we set ourselves. We wanted to be able to offer pieces of clothing that are all designed for men, but that can also be used by women. And this is also something we are working on. We had the chance to talk with you four years ago. We are now recording this little catch-up episode here. Can you give us a hint about your vision about Dada in the future? You have expanded a lot. You now have a staff here. Your offices are well installed. There is a new range for men, a new platform to sell second-hand pieces. How do you see the development of Dada? Are there still things to conquer, points on which you wish to improve, where you could innovate? There are plenty of them. The road is still long. There are a lot of directions to answer your question. Um, from a collection point of view, we're working on a lot of new things that I can't really talk about at the moment. But we saw them in the showroom. <laughs> Maybe not everything. The advantage now is that we are a bigger team, so we can work on several topics at the same time and in an even more precise, pointed way to always offer a more singular, a more technical wardrobe and really meet the needs of equestrian women and men. And then there are the collections we're working on that won't be coming out right away and that we'll surely talk about one day. Then there's also the business part where we aim to develop internationally. We have chosen not to go too fast in our development and it really was a choice. I really want to make sure that we don't rush things. Dada is expanded internationally a lot, but we don't do it too fast. We try to find really exclusive partners to work with, and I think that's what makes the soul of the brand today. We also have a lot of projects about what Dada is, 
in the equestrian world, but maybe also what Dada is outside these borders. We have a lot of projects, and what comes after is the eco-responsibility issue, including the circularity of clothing um, that we have already addressed a little, but on which we must always work. We also work with the media to make the industry of fashion discover our sports and to be able to help them understand what is a rider. Who is this dynamic woman who runs non-stop, who manages her work, her family life, her schedule? This is also something we are working on, that's to say, to modernize the image of the rider in the mind of the general public. We really are at the very beginning, but this is true that it's something we are working on. For me, what's really important is to say, okay, in fact, in the common imagination, we often have the impression that a rider is necessarily a very classic woman who rides a horse, who does not necessarily do anything else in her life. And our desire is to show that today you can ride a horse, be hyper-modern, be dynamic, have a job, you can run all the time. And this very complete picture, this dynamism, is what Dada Sports represents. Caro, let's meet in four years. Yeah, anytime. And I hope we get the chance to drink a coffee even sooner. In the middle of your busy schedule. Yeah, and what about you and your busy schedule? Hello, Enric. Thanks for being here. We are very, very happy to have you. Uh, I'm not sure we could think of a better guest today, as you are world number one, uh, world champion in individual and, and team, uh, Olympic champion. You won the top 10 yesterday. I think it's a great week to record this episode with you uh, in Geneva. So one year ago, very precisely, same day, same place, we were interviewing your teammate, Peder Fredriksen, uh, who was at the time also world number one. So in our podcast, the goal is to unveil the story of the guests, to understand who they are um, and to talk together about the current topics and concerns also of equestrian sports. And we know that you're a member, uh, board member of the IGRC, so we can talk about that also. If I'm right, you will let me know. You started taking riding lessons because your parents used to take you to Gothenburg show every year. And now you are 41 year old, you are currently world number one, you have all the titles a rider can dream of. And I could keep going with an endless list of incredible successes as yesterday in the top 10 final. Um, so could you please start by taking some time to tell us your story, like from the very beginning and through the main steps that led you to be gold team medal at the Tokyo Olympic Games? First of all, thank you for having me here. Um, okay, it's um, it's uh, a long story. It's I a guess. long story uh, because I'm getting a bit older. <laughs> um, no, uh, I started when I was um, very young to ride a little pony, um, but uh, it was a little bit difficult one. Uh, who always uh, run away with me, so I didn't think it was so funny anymore. So I stopped um, and I did a lot of other sports, you know, tennis, football, ice hockey, something I really like to do, but uh, somewhere I figured out that I was not really good enough and, and, and I didn't like that. So, um, as you said, my parents, they were always in Gothenburg Horse Show. I was born on a farm with all these animals. I always had the love for the animals. I was always there from the first day. And uh, yeah, in Gothenburg Horse Show, we went every year to watch the show. And uh, uh, something also that I, I really, really liked and um, inspired me. And, and so um, I, I said, let's uh, try it again. <laughs> a few years later, I went to a riding school then for two two summers, because my parents probably wanted to see if it just was like the other sports, fun for a while, and and then something new again. Uh, but I really got stuck with it. You worked yeah, along uh, for no less than 12 years. Can you tell us about this decision and the riding lessons and knowledge that you have acquired while training with Lodger? 
Okay, I was um, I was to 21 years old. Uh, um, my parents they told me quite early that they will support what they can to 21, and but after that I I, I need to find my own way and 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 uh, make it on my my own way. Um, so. Yeah, I tried on my own for one year, one and a half, uh, my own business in Sweden, and yeah, it it, it was okay, but it was more uh, training and uh, educating young horses to get the costs c covered, and I, I found out very quickly that uh, this is not going to lead to my dreams. This is not going to lead to the sport. This is going to lead to something <laughs> different. Uh, and um, at that time, uh, uh, when I was very young and I went to Gothenburg, uh, uh, I mean, Lutke was far by the number one in the world. And, and um, yeah, I uh, always had him as an idol. Yeah, a few years going there, I, um, I knew a groom uh, that worked for Lutke, uh, Colin Marlin Linskog, that I know very well. And uh, I always try to, you know, push her to ask yeah, if I could come to, maybe she can make sure that I could come and just watch and uh, uh, whatever, just come there. Uh, and I got a chance uh, for one month to go there and, and see and ride a little bit and so on. And uh, of course, after that, I was, uh, I was in heaven and, uh, and uh, I said, okay, this is what I want to do. This, what I'm doing at home, uh, is not uh, the way forward. So uh, a few months later, uh, after getting everything sorted at home, I, I went to Lutka and then I was 23 years old. And uh, yeah, by Lutka was many, many years. It was uh, my uh, high school. Uh, in the riding, it was uh, you learned uh, everything. I mean, riding is of course you have to be good in riding, but there are so many other things you have to do. Um, you have to especially manage your horses uh, in uh, all facts you need to know. You need to know uh, the way a horse uh, works, uh, needs, uh, you know, with farriers, vets, everything, feeding. And, and there you you got the whole package to know, and uh, also uh, with owners and the economic aspect of it all also. So um, yeah, it was a very very good education for me, and uh, I stayed there for yeah 12 years, and then 2016 I I left for my for my own after Rio Olympics. Just after the Olympics, you left, and a couple of months years ago, uh, last year I think maybe this year, you settled in Bonn, in Germany? Uh, no, I, I, I went to Bonn directly then, okay. from, from Lutka 2016, 1st of September. And then uh, uh, I um, was uh, um, at the place um, by Herr Karl Schneider. We knew each other before because of the horse Cantinero I had, that he organized at that time, went to Lutka and I could ride it. When I said to Lutke, I, I want to do the try on my own, I, I had the picture what I wanted. I wanted something small and, and something to, that I still can focus on the sport. And yeah, then Carl called me and maybe if it was a possibility to watch his place, uh, to rent by him. And he all, also had one, two horses that, that could maybe be interesting and so on. So I went to him and looked at the stable. and. And I was really said, okay, this is what I want. Uh, the, it was perfect. It was small. It was easy. Uh, um, and I always came uh, good with Carl. Uh, really uh, um, easy going, nice, uh, friendly person. Yeah, uh, you know, sometimes you feel with people that this is this is um, matching. And luckily, Carl also had uh, Mary Lou. It was one of the horses. There the trip started and uh, I had Mary Lou and she made uh, then a lot of things on the way possible. Yeah. So you learned with Ludger to, to ride for sure but also to build your own system. You are now settled with uh, your wife, Janika, um, in Germany. Um, no, in Holland. In Holland. So okay. that, that sorry, was the... Uh, I, I, under the time I was by Carl, I met Janika. Yeah. And then uh, um, we came over a, a, a property in Holland and, and there we built our farm.
So can you tell us a little bit about the system that you built uh, over there? The barn is quite small, as you described it. That's very important for you to be able to focus on sport and everything. Can you tell us a little bit about the system you have, the role each of you is playing also in the organization, Yannicka, you and all the stakeholders that must be working with you? Yeah, okay. It, when we made our farm, we had an idea uh, with the farm we built that we would like to have our competition stables with our horses. We have a stable with 14 boxes. For both of us, we don't want to have more. I don't want to grow big and uh, have a lot of riders and uh, horses. And I want to keep it small. I'm a little bit of a control freak. Uh, <laughs> so I want to have my hands on everything and I don't feel that something is slipping out of my hands. Um, so in that way, I wanted to keep it small. And then we had another stable with 12 boxes that we made for clients. Uh, so we said, okay, we, we, we try to make uh, uh, one or two clients and then uh, we have our competition. And then, of course, once in a while, we need to sell a horse also. That's how the, the, the base was. And um, luckily, we have a fantastic team. We have good clients. And then we, of course, a uh, very, very important part is our owner, uh, owners, uh, but of course, Uh, Georg Kenny, Dufo Stable, that owns King Edward, and two other very good horses. And then I have the Glamour Girl, that's owned by Robin Parsky. And then my student, Evelina Tovek, she's been by me for five, six years now. She came then, when I came to Bonn one year later, uh, she came into my stable. And, and in that way also, it was also luck, because at that time, Mary Lou was, of course, uh, Yeah, becoming a very good horse and people are was starting to to uh, have a good interest in her and then family Tovek bought her that I could keep her and so that was you know, one of also main stones that 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 there was possible that I could keep on riding her um, because in the end without a Mary Lou or King Edward uh, I would probably not sit here uh, so it's very very important and uh, you know, that's something I'm always be grateful for. You mentioned Evelyn Atovek that you train. Um, is this important for you to keep training people and to uh, have other roles other than riding? You know, to have other activities, side activities, so that you do not only focus on just riding horses every day, but you also have to teach to get to, to train and convey your messages to other people, other students. Yeah, for sure. It's also a part. Um, and also, I don't like, I, I always said, I don't want to ride uh, from morning to evening i feel that my body <laughs> is uh, come to a point where that is uh, not the best that i do i want to do to 100 percent um, so I, i do it a little bit smaller and a little bit more smaller scale but uh, i always feel motivated and all energy into it and of course uh, with a student I, i also really like to push and to see what i can achieve there Uh, but of course it's also a financial part, um, what we have to have. Um, we have good price money and so, but there's nothing that I want to rely on because it's, uh, you know, one day the horse is not okay and uh, suddenly, you, you know, so uh, trying to build a safe economic around it. So, Henrik, you are a little bit control freak. You seem also very positive, always smiling. And now that you have pictured a little bit the main step of your career, I'd like to ask you if you can describe your personality. Uh, what do you think are your main traits of character inside and outside the ring? Uh, it's nice that you say that, uh, because I have the feeling people think I'm a bit yeah. of a grumpy man. No. Uh, <laughs> No, and, and actually I am. Uh, I, I, I see myself as positive. I always try when it goes bad. Of course, I'm a bad loser, um, but somehow I pick myself up and I always see uh, what's in front of me and not what's behind me. But maybe when, when you see me around and I, I'm, I'm on the show, I walk a little bit in my own tunnel because I need it, I need to be very, very focused in what I'm doing, otherwise I have the feeling I will not uh, uh, perform at my best. Um, and I, I really don't like to have the feeling I could have done something different. I mean, lose, we always do, uh, very, more than we win, 
but with the feeling that I tried my best and I did my best, uh, I can live with it. The worst is when you have the feeling, oh, shit, you, you could have done something better. Uh, you could have been a bit more focused or thought of this or that. Um, yeah, then, then, uh, then it's more difficult to swallow it. Last year when we talked with Peter, he showed us one of his papers, you know, the one he has notes on and writes everything. Do you have small habits like that? No, I don't. I, I, of course, I have a bit of a system what I'm doing. I'm walking the courses when we have time, uh, quite many times, to really uh, control myself that uh, the plan what I have is, uh, is the right one. And uh, like I said, when it's time to ride, I, uh, I'm very focused on uh, what I'm doing. And um, yeah, otherwise, when it's not, I think I'm quite relaxed. That time around the classes, then uh, it's, uh, yeah. It's very, it's locked. It's very important. Yeah, yeah. So for the last couple of years, you have notably performed with one, of one very, very particular horse. We, we could talk about him for hours. King Edward, he won the top 10 yesterday again. Um, Yannicka has also ridden this horse up to the four um, star level, I guess? Five star. Five star? Five star. Okay. Um, some time ago, data analytics company Equi Ratings made him the fourth best jumper since 2010 based on his performances last year. Why and when did you decide that you would be his rider and uh, uh, no longer Yannicka? And um, could you tell that he is like he might be the best horse in the world today. Uh, okay, that came very um, <laughs> easy in the way that Yannicka got pregnant uh, with our son, our son Noah. Yeah, and and, and that time then uh, I took over the reins and it was not so long time before the Olympics. Then it uh, went well and we went to the Olympics and then the Olympics happened, how it happened. And then after that we said, okay, now we stay like it is. And I'm going to keep the horse. <laughs> yeah, I'm going to keep the horse. No, but uh, Yannicka brought him up. And, and, and of course it was uh, easier for me to take it over because I follow the horse all the time and we do everything together. And, and so I knew the horse already, even if I didn't ride it. So is he the best horse in the world? Yeah. And uh, he <laughs> <Yes>. is. <laughs> no, the, I have to say there's no... Uh, it wouldn't surprise me if this horse would be the ho best horse ever, to be honest. Um, touch wood. Okay. Uh, you know, they have to stay healthy and so, but he is... Uh, I mean, he's still 12 years old. Uh, and what he achieved already, and I believe if everything stays sound and uh, like it is now, he will achieve so much more. That's why with the top 10 yesterday I was really happy also for the horse uh, that he won it because it's been so fantastic horses winning that class, Shutterfly, Hickstead, I think uh, Hello Santos, uh, uh, yeah, this explosion, ex explosion exactly. Uh, so there are very special horses winning this class and he absolutely is one of them. So uh, he made that list even better. Enric, can we ask you to have a word about Zara? Uh, this is a mare that was produced by Thomas Lévesque and uh, he's a re regional uh, rider and she already was showing very good qualities. How can you tell that a specific horse like Zara, when you saw her in Lyon, I think, can compete at the highest level? What qualities did you spot in Lyon? Okay, you, you, you don't know before they do it. You can only, you know, uh, hope and, and... But the hope is important. You have to believe in your horse. If you don't believe in the horses, uh, then it would definitely will not work. And uh, she's a mare and she have this somehow fighting spirit in her. Uh, what for me is very, very important in horses. Um, because they, li they have to like what they do. Um, and, uh, yeah she always tries and and want to do it uh, in a good way and and that's the main part actually mm -hmm. and then in the end you have to see how how far they go and and in the end you know it first when they do it over the last couple of years we have observed um, the swedish team become stronger and more competitive how can you explain that? You were, okay, you always had very good riders, but now you have such a solid, such a performing 
team. Like in Tokyo, it seemed like no one could get the medal except you. Uh, yeah, okay, in Tokyo we were not far away to missing the medal, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, we were very strong, that's true, and of course in, in, in Tokyo it was uh, an um, incredible moment. We had uh, three good riders with three exceptional horses, uh, and that is quite rare. Normally you have one rider with an exceptional horse maybe, or maybe two, but to have three at the same moment is uh, incredible and, and we had a bit of luck on that way because to be honest if Covid wouldn't have been uh, I'm sure we would have not won that medal because uh, Peter's horse was not really 100% uh, it was too early for King Edward one year before um, so it all came together actually uh, and uh, the all horses were in the best shape um, I think at the World Games they also uh, said that uh, we are the oldest team, uh, <laughs> uh, with me being the youngest, I'm 41. Um, so, and I, I really believe in this sport, you, you really um, need, um, or need, but, but it's an advantage to have um, a lot of experience. Experience, mm. yeah, exactly. And, uh, and um, yeah and we know each other very very well I think it's also a plus we I mean I started to train for Peter many many years ago and I know Marlin we trained also together and then Rolf in our team uh, that was also a very important part even if he was not riding but to have a person like that around you um, he helped me all the time there in, in the Olympics and he gave a, a safe feeling um, and these things are uh, um, very important and, and I think the team spirit, what we had, uh, is great and I think it's also important. So the team spirit will be the, like the, the secret recipe for being a very talented s Swedish show jumper? No, it's, <laughs> it's not a recipe, it, but it's, it's these small details, all of them together makes the package and, and that's what we have. We have good riders, good horses, good team spirit, um, good organization, good team around us, uh, good owners. Uh, all these things uh, are so important and uh, in our sport nowadays there are so small things that can make the difference and when we went also to Tokyo we had only one goal and that was winning and I think that determination what we had and only this goal and nothing else we were very very prepared uh, with all the scenarios that could happen uh, jump off, uh, who's going, who's not going, who's starting, you know, we were very, very prepared because we had the feeling we lost the World Games uh, against America, the, was it two years before or three years before, because we were not so prepared. We said, oh, now it's jump off, uh, uh, and what are we doing now, you know, and we missed that medal, and uh, it, it felt like uh, if we would be a bit more prepared, we maybe could have done it better. And so we were very structured and um, I believe these small details made the difference. In an interview you say that our success in Tokyo has been great for the status of our sport in Sweden. Can you explain to us why and how uh, this has been good for your sport? Was there a before and an after Tokyo for the Swedish experience sports? Okay, the question sport been growing slowly through the years. I mean, we had great uh, Marlin and, and Rolf and then Peda uh, coming up and doing great success. Um, but I think the Olympics were maybe the turning point also because how the Olympics went. Our other sports, they were, they were no more sports. We were last. There was a... I think a Sunday morning in Sweden, there was nothing else on the television, it was raining outside. <laughs> uh, so everyone was inside, you know, and they knew there was the final and everyone was watching it. And, and, and people that had no clue about riding watched it also. And somehow it, it uh, inspired them or they, they thought it was, this is, you know, this is, this is fun to watch. And uh, I think, uh, yeah, the Swedish public then got an interest to it. and. Uh, we felt anyway that um, it, it uh, was growing and with this we got a few prizes also in Sweden so it, 
the media uh, got more involved. Um, so, yeah, no, no, it's it been growing definitely in, in our country. You, so you just said that you were the oldest team, <laughs> but do you have a young generation coming, a you know solid talents to come to be uh, the next champions in Sweden? Do you try, or is the federation trying to build the following generation? As we can see here. Yes, um, uh, it's a difficult question because it's uh, the federation is definitely trying to build. But in the end, I have to say, it's up to the people. It's not up to the federations. It's not up to, in the end, the people who made it was the individuals themselves. And not, you know, Rolf, he went to to, uh, to tops and, he, you know, he built his career and, uh, and Malin, or I went out also, you know, so it's, Um, it, it's it's difficult today to to rely. You you have to do it yourself. Mm. If you want it, you have to make it happen. Uh, you can't rely on someone else. Or uh, so yeah, it, it's it's a difficult part. Um, of course, with this strong what we had now the last years, uh, when this generation is gone, uh, it's a big hole to to fill. Uh, but we hope. I mean, we hope that it will come more. But the future will tell in the end. Um, there are some countries, of course, that you watch that you think, oh, they are really like England also. They have also a few really good ones. I would say we don't have that. Uh, I don't see that. Uh, or Switzerland. Um, but uh, yeah, we, we will see. So you are one of the very, very few riders I, that we can see at the very high level riding barefoot horses, um, just like better or Julien et Payard. This is a topic we wanted to talk with you as it seems to become more and more popular also in sports. We are very curious about it. Can you explain the path that and the steps that led you to be able to compete barefoot horses in the major championships? Okay, I mean, uh, every time when we um, is with the horses, uh, I look at every horse as uh, own individual. Um, and uh, every horse have their own story to tell uh, and, and in this way I always try to just see what is need for every kind of horse and of course we are trying to get absolutely the maximum of well-being of the horse and how I came into this was actually with uh, King Edward that uh, performed well but Even if the performance is well sometimes, you have sometimes doubts or feelings that something is not really like it should be or could be better. And with him it was that he was jumping a little bit to one side, he landed a little bit uncomfortable uh, on the big jumps. Uh, so I always try to, because I know the horse doesn't do that because of no reason. So I try to search for that reason all the time. And that's what we do with every horse. If you have this feeling that mm, something is not really to 100%, you have to search for it. Sometimes it's very difficult to find it because, I mean, we can't speak to them. Um, and, but with him, uh, you know, we, we have the vet there uh, uh, often and uh, we look at the horses all the time. Uh, but still, even if the vet said also, no, he's, he, everything is good, it's nothing. I felt that something is disturbing the horse. And then when I was in Doha, uh, two years ago, two and a half years ago, something like this, um, he jumped the first day and I had this feeling again that ah, something is disturbing the horse, um, but I couldn't put my finger on it. Then Julia Epaya was riding around and uh, I saw he was barefoot and I, because I'm very curious uh, as a person, when I see something I go there and I ask and I uh, always, because I think it's always a development in everything we do because still even if we have professors and uh, everything, no one can say they know exactly how it should be. Uh, there's something we have to find out by time. And uh, anyway, I got curious about that and I spoke to him about it and so on. And I knew that King Edward sometimes had a little bit of a, uh, in the soul, he was a little bit sensitive. Um, so then the, the 
procedure of, of, of what we do is we take off the shoes and we let them uh, without the shoes a while to let the feet recover and then we put the shoes on. And then I said, yeah, but why do we do that? Uh, you know, uh, if he's okay without, do you know what? I, I, I take them off also and, and see w what happens. And I have to say, I, it was between the two shows. There was um, our own Al Shakap, it's called, and then the Global the week after. Um, so in between, I said, okay, I take them off. Uh, I ride a few days because a few days in between, and see how he reacts. And I have to say, from the second day, third day, the horse felt so much freer somehow. I made a few small jumps on the warm-up also in between, and the horse just, you know, when you have the feeling that the, wow, the, ho the horse became freer, uh, it felt just better. Uh, yeah, and, and uh, yeah, and then I jumped him there without, and I just felt the horse was improving and feeling better and more confident and. Uh, so in this way uh, it went on and then by time I uh, looked at other horses and said okay this we try with that and okay now today I have uh, one horse we choose in the stable because of some reasons uh, and the rest is barefoot. On the official Olympics uh, website we can read the following words spoken by you. At the end of the day winning is just a crown. Uh, it's never the same, every day is different, there isn't any other sport like this. Some days are great and some days you end up falling in the mud. You never know what could happen. We all know that high level equestrian sports are a very glittery world. Uh, with great sponsors, with great money. How do you, as a very successful rider, manage to keep rooted and grounded? Yeah, to manage to stick you know, to your original values and not to be overwhelmed by all the glitters and... and oh, it's very you know. easy in our sport, uh, it's, I think. Because, like you say, it's a work we do seven days a week. We live with the horses and every day is a new challenge. Um, and the day you sit back and think, ah, oh, this is quite good, you're losing already. And, and even if your horse, I have a horse like King Edward, they develop and you have to be so careful in what, what you're doing and follow the horses, how they react, what they do, because horses are changing and getting older as we are getting older. And you have to really try to be a step ahead of things that could happen. So I think it's very easy, to be honest. Uh, uh, it's... Uh, But that's, uh, for me, like I said, the winning is the crown of the whole thing. But the, for me, the path there, it's the fantastic part. You know, when, when you think about, or when I think about the World Championship, how we started that trip after the Olympics and said, okay, this is our goal. We make a plan. This is how we're going to do it and, and follow it. And of course, on the way, there are a few small hiccups uh, that you have to adopt to. Um, but the way it went like we wanted and, 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 and that is what I bring with and uh, that's the interesting part and I, I have to say I've been riding I would say hundreds of horses through my life but they're all different and uh, you, you always come to a new problem where you've never seen before uh, it's not that you ride the horses the same everyone is different and I believe in that we have to adopt to the horses and of course we have to have a red line in it uh, but, but you have to adopt to the, the, the individuals and their needs and their uh, well-being uh, to, uh, to succeed and uh, this is what I really like to do to figure out these small details. We met um, Eric Navet this year in Wellington and he was sharing some stuff when, while recording and he was saying that the moment he rides horses to try to find a solution to try to understand is the best moment for him even if he's not uh, able to compete as long as he can ride a horse even flat ride he is the happiest. Is it the same for you? For sure, I need the competition. <laughs> I, I, you know, the adrenaline and this, this, this uh, drives me. Uh, but uh, this is what we do every day. And like I say, the way there. But you want to see the results, the end of the tunnel. Uh, but the way to the end of the tunnel is uh, it's a really satisfying. It's the same here at the top 10 yesterday. Uh, after the World Championship, I made a new plan. I said, okay, uh, it will be Prague and it will be uh, the top 10 that, that my goals are. 
and uh, because in the end, even if you have a horse like King Edward, you can't keep them on the top top uh, uh, performance all the time. You have to let them come down, uh, start over a little bit, and then peak a little bit their 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 performances. Um, I do not believe that you can keep the horses, you know, on that peak all the time. Uh, you have to uh, allow them to make mistakes. Um, so, um, yeah, um, the way then to this top 10 yesterday that I won, uh, again, working like what we, how we wanted it. And uh, it's a very satisfa satisfying sorry, uh, uh, feeling. When we talked uh, we, with Peder last year, Peder confided that becoming world number one had been his driving goal for the last few years. But he also tell us that his family and his personal life was also very, very important for him. Was becoming world number one uh, was a the goal, the, the quest uh, for you? I mean, I have many goals. Uh, the list is very, very long. Uh, for sure, there was one. I mean, you always, when you were small, you always said, ah, I want to be the best in the world. Uh, then to have it on paper, uh, it's, uh, it's very nice. And of course, it was a goal to be there. Uh, even if I really tried to just stick to my plan, I knew I had an amazing horse or horses. Um, so I knew if I just stick to my plan, I do what I can, then it will come. Now it's easy afterwards to say, oh, it worked out uh, uh, because it did. But it, it was actually that. But of course, anyway, in this sport, when you have a horse like this, you have to control yourself and really stick to your plan and not getting, like you said, uh, get into this uh, hunger of more. Um, because we have to be very, very careful with our horses. Uh, and, uh, and, and make a plan because they have, I believe, uh, this many jumps in a year uh, to keep them in a very healthy way, uh, not only um, physically but also in the mind, keep them motivated because they, they don't really motivate it in the ring, then you are losing. So, um, yeah, it's, a, it's a, always a fine line. Uh, with uh, with this and, and this is what I always say I mean to bring a horse into a Grand Prix level is not so difficult if you can ride a bit but to keep it for years and years years running till the day comes of the retirement uh, that it makes the difference between between the good uh, horse people So what's your plan now? My <laughs> plan now is to uh, to, uh, to do uh, next day and next day is uh, we have the um, Grand Prix here in Geneva, that is our big goal and then uh, it's finished for King Edward for this year and then next year the main goal will be the World Cup final. Do you want to remain at the first position of the ranking list? Are you struggling? Are you fighting for it? Uh, I would be uh, lying if I said no, no, I, I don't want to be the number one. I don't care. <laughs> yeah, I don't care. <laughs> uh, but at the same there, I have a great horses now a group of horses that really is fantastic uh, a few nine-year-olds that are becoming tender next year and uh, that developed very good like Ileana she jumped three 160s she's been fourth fourth and fifth uh, now I have another one here it's called Kalisi a nine-year-old she was also placed the first die in the 160 uh, I have Zara uh, what is nine uh, who I will try in London to jump the World Cup with uh, and then of course King Edward and, and um, so and then Glamour Girl also what, what's uh, um, winning unbelievable classes so I have a really good string of horses and with that kind of string it should be possible to, to keep on going as number one um, but it's a day by day and I try to take week by week and, and uh, show by show and then we see what happens One last question so you are Olympic champions, you are now um, world champion. First in the ranking list, you have an amazing wife, Yannicka. She is an incredible rider also. You have an ensemble boy. Do you still have dreams? Oh, I have many dreams. Um, there's so many things. I mean, uh, uh, but I have to say my life changed also a lot with uh, the family I have now. Uh, you can enjoy it even more because you enjoy it together and not uh, a lonely wolf. <laughs> uh, 
uh, and it's a fantastic and I try really try to enjoy it because I know this situation I'm in is it's uh, unique uh, situation um, but at the same time uh, we cannot just sit still and and uh, and uh, be happy we have to uh, somehow I have to keep on moving um, but um, yeah, no it's um, I really enjoy my life and I'm really thankful for what I have and, and um, I keep on trying thank you very much thank you we wish you the best of luck for tomorrow's Grand Prix yeah. <laughs> thank you